Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Resistance TV. This evening we're going to be discussing whether worker cooperatives have the potential to bring about an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power. Uh, we should have two guests with us, although we only have one uh, online at the moment. We're hoping that Ross Ashcroft will join us a little later. Uh, but our first guest is John Atherton. He's the head of membership at Cooperatives UK, which is an organization that helps people establish worker cooperatives. Uh, people may be familiar with Ross Ashcroft. He's a broadcaster and a co-founder of Renegade Inc., who made the seminal documentary uh, called The Four Horsemen, which shone a light on the broken banking system. Um, Obviously, John, we're going to have to start with you because we, we we don't have another guest. But uh, I was struck by the Labour Party manifesto in 2017, particularly, which had a very clear commitment to worker cooperatives. And I'll just read you the passage from that particular manifesto and then compare that with the manifesto from 2019. In 2017, uh, the manifesto said in government, Labour would give more people a stake and a say in our economy by doubling the size of the cooperative sector and introducing a right to own, making employees the buyer of first refusal when the company they work for is up for sale. Uh, and it uh, went on to uh, say in the 2019 manifesto, we will give a new cooperative development agency a mission to double the size of the cooperative sector, but it had dropped the commitment to give workers the right to buy out their company and establish a worker cooperative. So I just wondered what your thoughts were about the uh, cooperative movement and what the potential is really to grow it, particularly in light of the in ever increasing number of people who are forced into self-employment. Perhaps we could start there really and and whether or, or to really get your thoughts really on uh, helping and encouraging people to look at establishing worker cooperatives in the first instance, rather than necessarily being forced into uh, self-employment, which, as we know, many people, probably millions of people, would rather they were in, a, in an employee situation or possibly uh, be preferred to establish a, a cooperative if they had the wherewithal and the support to be able to do so. Yeah, so just to start, obviously, we welcome any uh, mention of co-ops in any manifesto, obviously, particularly the Labour Party manifesto. Uh, our sister organisation, the Co-op Party, works really hard to work with the Labour Party. Um, and so, yeah, we're Co-ops UK, we're basically about helping people solve problems and solve problems through setting up co-ops. Uh, that might be, and there's lots of different sorts of co-ops, but in this instance, it's usually solving the problem of, I need a job and not just I need any job. I want a job that's got decent pay, decent conditions, and, and there's a mission to it. You know, we're not just doing it for the cash. We're doing it because we believe in what we're doing. So we help people set up work, work our own co-ops, basically. Yeah, I mean, the and, cooperative yeah. movement's got quite a tradition in this uh, country, hasn't it? And, uh, you know, going back uh, well over a century, I suppose 150 <laughs> years ago, uh, were the uh, origins of the cooperative uh, movement. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps give us some of the historical context as well about the co-op movement in this country. Yes, well, my organisation, Co-ops UK, we're 150 years old this year, actually. Uh, yeah. And yeah, the first uh, co-op in, in Rochdale um, was in 1844. And there's a lot of similarities, actually, between then and now. Then there was huge industrial change. You know, then it was technological change in factories and, and, and machinery. Now it's obviously AI and robots. Back then, there was a huge issue around um, food, food security, food poverty. Uh, then it was more adulteration of food. Now, of course, we're talking about chlorinated chicken. Back then, there was a huge shift of people uh, into precarious work away from artisan weavers and artisan uh, other roles into working in factories and and again like then there was a huge inequality issue there was a growing uh, growing poverty growing poor people and increasing wealth of factory owners and, and mill owners and so really the co-op movement back then was a response to all of those issues and all of those problems normal everyday people faced and again probably similar to back then the government 
wasn't very effective at the time. Banks weren't very effective at the time. And so essentially co-ops were started um, because people had to, they had no choice. And so the whole premise of co-ops is self-help, um, doing things um, for yourself, mostly by yourself because no one else will help you. And and really we see a lot of similarities in, in today's economy with precarious and gig work. And to be frank, um, a lack of interest from the current government in supporting the cooperative movement is no different uh, as well. No, indeed. And uh, obviously the cooperative movement was a, a hugely important and uh, influential movement uh, all those years ago. And it demonstrated really how solidarity and uh, you know working class uh, coming together in solidarity can actually in spite of a hostile uh, government and uh, economic circumstances which which clearly don't favor uh, the working class and, and certainly that's the situation today as you pointed out there with the huge growth in precarious uh, employment and so on and uh, i mean you mentioned the Rochdale pioneers, but I mean, how quickly did the cooperative movement spread at that time? I think obviously they called the Rochdale pioneers because they were the first out of the traps, weren't they? Um, yeah. I know there's quite a long, where I come from in Derby, there's, there's a longer tradition of the cooperative movement to here. But as a lad growing up, I mean, there seemed to be, I know there seemed to be a lot, a lot more um, buy into or a lot of awareness maybe of the, uh, the cooperative movement you know i remember i still remember my divvy number uh, you know where the mom and dad used to give uh, when they you know went to the local uh, co-op and there seemed to be a, a you know a co-op in uh, this is a co-op shop of course uh, in every local area and uh, uh, i just wonder whether or not um, you see that there is um, an increasing interest in in the cooperative movement now i mean obviously you're different from the the, the co-op shops in that sense we're talking about worker cooperatives and uh, and clearly in the you know the tony ben era in the the 1970s and so on there was a there was a big push uh, uh in relation to uh cooperatives but i don't know whether or not it's that's that you know the the support for that seems to have been aware a bit from from central government would you think or or not in terms of you know support for the cooperative uh, and, and worker cooperatives yeah so back in 1844 um they basically were they became a cooperative movement because they were a very successful business essentially you know there were uh, attempts to set up self-help you know democratically owned organizations before that point and to be frank most of them had failed uh, what the co-op pioneers did is they kind of they got the dna of how to run a cooperative organization right you know um, one member one vote you know the dividend and, and lots of other parts of that that dna that were successful and then they essentially, the other thing that made them a success in a movement, as opposed to just one business, was the penny post. And so the original pioneers, because they were so proud of what they've done and people were very interested in what they've achieved, they essentially, through letters, passed the message around the whole country. And, and so, yeah, the growth of the co-op movement was slower back then because technology was different and it did take you know, decades to get up to the numbers of the thousands, but it, it did get there. Whereas nowadays, obviously, good ideas can travel much quicker than they used to and i suppose the one thing i tend to say about yeah and, you, and you're right about the co-op movement in the uk it's not as strong as it could be and not as strong as it was at one point the uh, the, the co-op the retail shops you talked about they had about 30 percent of the grocery sector they were huge everybody had you know as you say everybody had a co-op shop near them and you know things happen competition happens uh, things move on and um, but what's really important, I suppose, for us to remember in the UK, and I use the analogy of football, which uh, is a terrible analogy, but works, which is we invented football, but actually we're pretty terrible at football now compared to other countries. And mm. we're the same with co-ops is we invented co-ops and we shared the, the message about co-ops and the model of co-ops with the world. And other parts of the world are so much better at co-ops than we are, whether it's France or Germany or Spain in the, in the UK, um, in the EU, or whether it's places like India, uh, which uh, just have tremendous cooperative economies. And I think it's worth rem not looking at what can be achieved when you look at the, the UK sector, but looking at what can be achieved when you look at, say, India. So in India, uh, there's a farmer co-op uh, owned by the you know, farmers with 60 million members, 60 million farmers, all part of one co-op in India. And it just tells you the scale that co-ops can reach. 
um, oddly enough in America, uh, the rural electric, you know, the, the electric utility, uh, most of the, the uh, rural electric economy is, um, is co-ops. When you move to places like uh, France, um, uh, quite a lot of champagne, oddly enough, is marketed through uh, far pharma co-ops. And so really yeah. the, the co-op economy around the world is, is huge, is, is, is a huge part of people's lives. There's about um, three million co-ops around the world and, they, and about a, a billion people are members of co-ops around the world. And so when you look at those sorts of stats, you kind of think, why aren't there as many co-ops in, mm. in the UK as, as there could be? And yeah, I would say it's because in other lots of other countries, the governments of any political persuasion uh, are more supportive towards co-ops because they see them as a fundamental good. You know, they're there for they're there for people, they're not there for capital. And that's the big you know, there's one way you can say, why, why is a co-op business different than any other business? I would say it's because the people who are most important, to, you know, people are most important to the business, not capital. It's yeah, so I mean, capital. And that's... Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, because one of the things that um, we are very keen on um, supporting, uh, and obviously one of the reasons why we've brought you on this evening to talk about cooperatives uh, within the... Uh, aims and objectives of the resistance movement that we are trying to, to build now uh, is, a, is a very strong commitment to uh, supporting the establishment of uh, cooperatives. Um, none of the steering committee, though with all due respect to them, I don't think any of us have got the expertise as it were, but we are in support of the principle. So I wonder whether or not you might be able to sort of set out the kind of work that you do uh, in terms of you know, if anybody's listening in now and thinking, actually, I'm quite attracted by this, but I'm not quite sure where to start. I mean, what, what, what would, what, you know, what would people do? How would they sort of go about establishing and what kind of support can your organisation offer to uh, people who are interested in establishing a co-op? Yeah, and that's why we do things like this. The biggest issue with co-ops is awareness. People, people don't know about them. And I think particularly professionals who set up companies and businesses for people don't know about them and so it's never really an option put forward and so how do you set up a co-op the the obvious thing is you need two people you know at least two people hopefully three or four people um and really it's about any other organization um what what's it there for it's there to solve a problem it's to, there to solve a problem that you probably can't solve on your own and so the any co-op, any co-op organisation starts from that premise of I've got a need as an individual that I can't deal with on my own. So I will work with some other people and together with our shared skills, our shared resources, uh, we'll work together to, to meet all of our shared need. That might, you know, in the case of a worker co-op, obviously that's usually the need, as I've said before, for decent work and a job. But it might be to solve a particular community problem. So we work particularly at the moment with a lot of um, people where they're la la the last pub in the village is closed or the last shop in the village is closed and they've got no no other alternatives. And so the community get together and um, save the pub or save the shop. And we've, we're setting up a lot of co-ops like that at the moment. Or um, another example is cycle couriers, which is particularly hot at the moment, or taxi drivers, where we're working with, uh, it's a, a French app, actually. A French co-op has set up a app to, to support uh, cycle couriers to get together and do business together and, and, and get, get business together. And we're working with co-ops in York and Birmingham at the moment of cycle couriers. And it's, it's essentially... So that would be like a, um, an alternative to Deliveroo then or something like that, is that? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah so... I guess taxi drivers similarly could, could benefit, couldn't you? Know, the Uber taxi drivers, would that be a, a possibility, do you think? Yeah, and so that we, we're... At the moment, there's there's growth, particularly of co-ops, where people are particularly hard done to. In essence, that's where self-help can tends to come to the fore. If you can just work for a, a fairly nice, fairly ethical business and not go to the hassle of setting up your own business, then you probably would choose that option first because it's you know less hassle. Whereas if you feel like you're hard done to, you feel like you're taking advantage of, that tends to be when people make the effort to set up their own cooperative, their own business. And so, yeah, with um, and there's a lot of work, obviously, with I know the IWW unions doing a lot of work with uh, to uh, support delivery um, people at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, we're 
co-ops tend to come in after the unions have had their go, if that makes sense. So we work a lot with unions who are trying to mobilise workforces for decent decent work. And when you know the the organisation doesn't play ball, that's when cooperatives come in as an alternative, where it's where it's like you know we'll do this ourselves. Thank you very much. And so yeah, taxi yeah. drivers is another example. Um, even also, the, even the, of, oh, go on, sorry. No, carry on, John. The, um, the precarious work around creative agencies, professional agencies. So again, those sorts of freelancers, you know, um, web designers, creative creative types. We're doing a lot of work in those sorts of sectors where, again, it's just gig work. They're just getting piecemeal work from time to time. Yet, if they got all the job, they'd get paid a lot more. So we're doing a lot of work to grow cooperatives of creative workers, essentially. And what does that look like? Like I said, it's it's getting two or three people in a pub or in a cafe to talk to each other to share the issue they've got and it's like a lot of how other a lot of other businesses start you know you've got that passion to set up a business the difference is you're setting up a business with some other people and it's it's really like setting up no other business what's your business idea you know have you got the skills to do it all that sort of stuff and what crosses uk and and our advisors where we come in is we basically help them with the technical advice and support. So we can't help somebody with a business idea. That's their job. But as soon as they've got a business idea and they think it's viable, that's where we come in. We help them with, you know, the marketing, the legal structures, the financial models, uh, all all that sort of advice and support. But then because it's also a co-op, we do all... Do you provide finance? or? We provide... or not directly we work with other organizations there's a right. for specifically worker co-ops there's an organization called cooperative and community finance and they lend money you know they lend money to uh, worker co-op startups we also help uh, cooperatives raise finance from their members so again it's more difficult for a worker co-op if you've got a fairly small membership of, wor uh, of workers whereas if you've got a community around you who are willing to support that endeavor um, then we will help cooperatives raise finance from their their local community, or you know, it's a bit like crowdfunding. You, if you've got a really good idea and you, and you and people think it's a good idea and want to support it, then you can do that through through cooperative structures. And a lot, like, like I say, a lot of the community shops and pubs, um, putting up a wind turbine, stuff like that, you can raise cooperative finance to do. More difficult with local co-ops; they tend to borrow money, and there are yes, there are some uh, cooperative specific. Uh, lenders who will lend money to you um and really that's that's our job it's to get people's business models right and to give them that advice and support and also help them work together so, you know one of the big challenges of setting up a co-op which is different than being an individual entrepreneur is you, you have to work with other people and so a lot of the yeah. advice and support we give is how to run an organization democratically you know it's one member one vote at the end of the day that's that's a a core principle of a co-op and so a lot of the work we do is helping people work with each other and your, your organization is is it any any type of co-op that you if, work with or i mean you know so from from manufacturing industry to a housing co-op would you work uh, with with a with a housing co-op for example or or not can you can you hear me so we work we work with virtually every sector um right yeah i can hear you we work with virtually every sector i there's particular focus at the moment in the help sector and like i've said in the freelance gig economy um they're the, they're two of the stronger areas at the moment setting up a co-op without government support in that sense is harder in uh, capital intensive businesses um because basically if you have to raise a lot of money um if you can't raise that money from government funds or, or, or government supported programs, that's really tough. Um, mm. So where cooperatives have been very successful in other countries in converting, you know, factories and in the manufacturing industry, it's where the mm. government has provided, you know, central funds to support the buy, you know, the buyout or the investment in that, that capital intensive business. So in the UK, because we don't have that sort of government support, co-ops tend to set up in um in sectors where you don't need a lot of capital to get going so that's why yeah. it tends to be freelancer co-ops or those sorts of gig economy jobs where essentially as long as you've got a bike or a laptop or a car that's all you need mm. 
So, yeah, Just in terms of the areas we're supporting. You made that point as well, I guess, uh, a lot of, and I think that's probably true, a lot of people, uh, given the, the choice, would would probably just go for the employer-employee relationship if the employer was, uh, as you put it, a kind of decent employer um, paying a reasonable salary and so on. But even in those circumstances, of course, uh, inevitably the worker is generating surplus value. I mean, that's the kind of nature of capitalism, isn't it? And the thing about uh, you know cooperatives is that um, everybody's got a, a equal stake in it, uh, in a sense. And so, you know, the the the, the fruits of the workers' labours are more equitably distributed, aren't they? So it is a, a case for urging people, even in those uh, circumstances where they are uh, reasonably content with the kind of employer-employee relationship, to look at a cooperative uh, as, as an alternative model. Yeah, exactly. And I think the interesting thing about co-ops is there's nothing fundamentally written down that co-ops are are ethical, you know, moral businesses. It's just mm. weird in a way that if you've got a business which puts people before capital and the business is democratically owned, it's a funny thing that it tends to be a very moral, ethical organisation. Uh, it tends to work in sectors which are sustainable, um, that have, you know, the people who run co-ops tend to be more interested in environmental um, and social issues, not because it's, because it's like a, it's part of the DNA of the co-op. The co-op's just a, you know, a, a business form, a legal form. It's because when you allow people that autonomy to do what they want to do and the way they want to do it, funnily enough, they tend to do it in a moral way. And it kind of gives me quite a lot of faith in, um, in human nature. And so, yeah, a lot of co-ops, I would say they are just a better way of running your business, whatever your business is. And that business will probably be more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. Uh, we'll probably have better, you know, um, even if it's not a worker co-op, even if it's a traditional consumer owned co-op, you know, we'll think we'll think and care about its employees more than the average business, because that's just the nature of of the business it's in. And yeah, specifically for worker co-ops, the whole point of set, setting up a worker co-op is decent pay. You know, um, uh, there's a great example in uh, near, near me in, in West Yorkshire called Suma. Suma is a, a wholesale distribution business. You know, yeah, yeah. they basically they they have a massive warehouse uh, with lorry drivers. They shift they shift uh, food about. Uh, they've been working very busy through the COVID situation. Um, you know. 400 employees, probably more like 50 million turnover business. So, you know, sizable, sizable business. What makes them different as, as a worker co-op is they don't have a chief exec. Um, they don't have this very well-paid management team. They have a flat management structure um, and they have flat pay. So everybody in, in SUMA, all, you know, all three or 400 of them get paid exactly the same wage. And what's crazy about that is in the warehouse so you know most warehouse jobs are minimum minimum wage you know in in suma uh, it's 40 grand a year <laughs> you know, mm. just let that let that sink in they because they're a very successful business because they're a very efficient productive business and because all the people in the organization share the roles out so they do uh, what's called multi-skilling so they may spend part of the the week in the warehouse, shifting boxes about, uh, and they might spend half a uh, part of the week writing the comms and um, marketing strategy for the business, um, mm. and likewise. So they they mix labour labour intensive jobs and you know you suppose intellectual intensive jobs within uh, within and around the workforce, which means they can they can work very efficiently and and they can pay themselves very well, and so. I think you know they have, they pay something like forty percent more than the industry average for their industry, yeah. and the only reason they can do that is because they're a worker co-op, and yeah, all I mean, the profits of that business stay with the yeah, workers. We, we we look at that, and, we, and you know, you you know, you say about people working in a warehouse and and being paid a decent salary, and, and we see that as extraordinary. But of course, that ought to be the the norm, really. And uh, it's interesting as well that you mentioned Suma because and the model that they employ, because often you'll hear the kind of the right wing skeptic saying. Uh, you had a, a flat structure like that, that that you know you wouldn't people wouldn't be motivated you wouldn't you know you wouldn't get the, the talented people that you need and yet suma 
has been thriving for a long time. I was part of a whole food cooperative in Derby in the late 1970s, although Derby wasn't quite ready for the vegan whole food revolution in 1978. But we we were uh, we were supplied by uh, Suma, uh, actually. So uh, a number of the, the, uh, the produce that we were selling um, was actually provided by, by Suma. I think we've now got um, Ross has actually joined us, Ross Ashcroft. Uh, um, I can see him. Um, hi Ross, how are you? I'm pleased you've been able to 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 join us. I'm sorry it's taken so long. Uh, there's been some technical hitches this end, but uh, we're, no we're worries. Now. Yeah, no worries. And yeah, yeah. Well, let, let me let me just uh, give you uh, the uh, the sort of uh, big drum roll and intro. Um, uh, I think I did mention just before you 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 was well, not just before, but at the beginning of the the program uh, said that uh, obviously you, you know you're a broadcaster, co-founder of Renegade Inc. and uh, the uh, uh, director of the uh, the seminal documentary, The Four Horsemen, which uh, shone a light on the uh, the uh, the broken banking system. And I was just talking to to John there about the the origins of the cooperative movement in in Britain and the sort of work that his organisation does in in helping uh, people who are interested in uh, establishing co-ops. And I know obviously you're very interested in the cooperative movement yourself, and obviously the reason why I invited you to participate in the program uh, this evening, uh, Ross. Uh, and I wonder, perhaps, um, I know when we spoke on the phone, we, we talked about the Mondragon experience in in Spain, and I guess uh, you know some people viewing may think that co-ops inevitably are you know a very small beer and uh, uh, kind of at best a kind of medium-sized enterprise. But I wonder whether you could say a little bit about your experience of uh, Mondragon and, and how that started and, and where it sits now in the... Well, look, yeah, yeah. Look, the, 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 the big thing about Mondragon was that um, it was never designed to be a commercial enterprise. And if you ever want to talk about socialism and, and, and people doing well for themselves and entrepreneurship and, and people you know, advancing their own um, economic needs because they have to, then you've got... Um, Jose Maria Alajara, unpronounceable, but he's a wonderful man who ultimately was a Catholic priest in the Basque country who started Mondragon, right? So, and and every Saturday uh, or Sunday morning, he went and he um, took a Hessian bag around what would have been his Sunday school. And he started teaching, um, people who were coming to Sunday school, the um, basic points about entrepreneurship. So Mondragon, you know, unlike so many cooperatives, I would argue every cooperative in the world doesn't ever start with a commercial interest. Every cooperative in the world starts with a human interest and that uh, eventually burgeons into a commercial interest because ultimately when people get together, uh, and create value, it becomes a commercial prospect. Mm -hmm. So, so the Mondragon um, model, you know, is is unique. Yeah, absolutely. But here's the killer point on all of it, and and this might be really difficult to to swallow. The Mondragon point, and the Mondragon model, and the Mondragon moment in time was because Franco uh, absolutely um, put the um, put the uh, Basque people to the knee, right? He, so, he, so, so they, so, so Fra Fra Franco said, "Look, th these people, because they were so rebellious, because they were so socialist, because they were so um, organised." Franco basically said, "Look, enough." So he he wanted to starve, um, yeah, totally starve that that group of people. And, and say, you know, we can't, we, we have to vanquish you. And out of that desperation came cooperatism. And, you know, I, I hate I hate to break this to you, um, but I don't think that in the West so far, we have had the type of... Um, we, we've got inordinate amounts of inequality. We've got enormous, inordinate amounts of poverty. We've got inordinate amounts of um, uh, social degradation. All that stuff, but we haven't had that catalyst, that moment. We haven't had that moment where people say, "Listen, 
we've got to collaborate now instead of compete. Mm. And, you know, Joseph Schumpeter talks about creative destruction. I think we've got a long, long way to go, five, seven, eight years to go, until people realize how broken they are and how they can't make uh, an income, uh, how they can't create value, how they can't get, get any returns until they get to a point where they say, okay, fine, look, stop. We now need to collaborate. We now need to um, do this together. And, and I think that the Mondragon model only happened really is because the Basque people were absolutely on their knees and a Catholic priest at that time came along and started teaching um, lessons of entrepreneurship because he realized that trying to teach them from the Bible was futile. Yeah. I mean, the, the question I posed at the top of the program, Ross, before you were able to, to join us was, do worker cooperatives have the potential to bring about an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in Britain? Given what you've just said, uh, notwithstanding the very high levels of inequality and, and poverty in Britain, do you think that's pie in the sky or do you think there is some potential? To yeah, I think, I think I, to be honest, I think it's really pie in the sky at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, I was going to say, one of the things that, that, this, I've, that our organisation is, 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 is keen to support as part of our aims and objectives is to is to support the cooperative uh, movement and to, you know, help communities, encourage communities, uh, particularly communities that are that are really struggling. Uh, I mean, you know, there are many up and down the country. You look at the coalfield communities, for example, where there is uh, huge levels of, of poverty, maybe not on the scale that you were talking about in the Basque region in Franco's era, but um, there's very little in the way of um, any government investment going into those uh, communities um very little opportunities for for people um and you know i'm hoping anyway uh, to well certainly part of our objectives anyway is to try work with communities when we can get beyond this uh, this lockdown this uh, covid pandemic to encourage and, and assist and obviously john in his role in the work that, that he does we're hoping that you know that he will we can put people in touch with with, with his organization to encourage and assist people to you know think about uh moving in in the direction of of a cop and i mean what's your thoughts on that uh, uh, I, I, I don't think people are there yet if i'm no. really honest the, the big joke what is do do, then? what do we need to do to get people there right so so i think the big you know the big joke around the cooperative movement is that the problem with the co-op movement is that it's not very cooperative and it doesn't move very much and it's very difficult to tell people that they're going to be better off in a co-op when, for 40 years since Thatcher, basically, you're better off staying at home and doing a bit of um, online betting or, or minimum wage work and all the rest of it because your home will make more money than you do uh, from, from you know, compound over 20 years from a wage perspective. Mm. And now, now, that, now that isn't always the case, but the point yeah. is that land speculation or, or house price speculation or what we should call it in the proper terms, you know, uh, which are, is the, the um, what, what did that you call it? That wonderfully deaf term, um, property owning democracy. Oh, that's right, yeah. right. Yeah. so. Shareholding so, so, democracy, yeah. Right, and then shall so so now we've got this moment. Right, we've got this moment where that's worked for 40 years, worked for 40 years. Now it doesn't work anymore. So now you're pushing strength. So now people, and this is the key point, don't have the um luxury of competition. Right. So so now you've got to start to collaborate. So all those 40 years, you can have all that competition. Estate agents would earn fees. Bankers would earn fees. Lawyers would earn fees. Everyone would earn fees. And that would all buoy the economy. 
and it would create what we call the wealth effect, right? All gone. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? What, 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 what are you going to put in place now after 40 years of Reaganomics or Thatcherism? What are you going to do now? Over to you. Yeah, I don't think we can rely on, on government. Uh, and um, there was a, a stronger commitment, and I'll perhaps come back to that in a moment, in the Labour Manifesto in 2017 in terms of what role the government could, could play. Um, but uh, uh, I just wonder, John... Um, how would you respond to 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 some of the uh, the criticisms that Ross has outlined there? So just to give a, I agree on Mondragon. Mondragon's a very special case, and there's no way you could recreate Mondragon uh, in the UK. But you can look to other models from other countries. I think um, Emilia Magna in Italy is one of the regions where the COP economy in some parts is about thirty percent of the local economy, and what that gives you, uh, as I was told by a local, was it means that the rest of the economy has to behave itself a little bit more. So do I ever think the cooperative economy is going to be 100% of the private sector? No, of course it isn't. Do I think the co-op economy, that's big enough and, and, and at enough scale in a diverse economy with other ownership structures to make sure that the wider market behaves itself? That would be my goal. And yeah, so I would love to live in a world where uh, cooperatively owned businesses had 20 to 30 percent of the economy, because then you would have a situation where there was competition and people would have to be mindful of, you know, how they treated their workers, you know, how they treated their customers, etc. cetera. Um, but I do agree it's it's a very, very long way away. And I do also agree that it's very hard to set up your own business. It's very hard to leave your current workplace even if you're poorly treated and to be frank i do agree it has to get a lot worse before people are pushed into helping themselves and that's just the nature of it but i of course am hopeful that if people do help themselves cooperative models are one of the best ways they could go in this instance um, in a way it's slightly depressing listening to both of you because you both seem to be extolling <laughs> a uh, council of despair really that uh, it worries me and there's bugger all we can do um I'm trying to be kind of, uh, you know, optimistic and uh, and say, look, you know, it's about will, political will in the end. And uh, if, if surely... No, 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 no. Go on, no, go on. No. That's absolutely, Chris, respectfully, that's absolute nonsense. Okay. It's not about political will. The political class have absolutely zero, 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 zero. Let me just cut across you, Ross. I'm not talking about political will from the, uh, the political class, as you put it. I'm talking about political will... Uh, from you know organisations like ours within the the communities, I mean polit politically, I suppose in a sense with with a small p rather than a party political p. Part of the problem we've got is the failure of the political class, and uh, you know it's kind of it's left people uh, abandoned people. It's abandoned communities, abandoned their responsibility in a sense to create a good society. And look, surely the situation uh, that confronted them maybe. It perhaps reiterates the points that you're both making, really, that, that, that the things were, were very, very desperate when the cooperative movement first started in this country 150 odd years ago. But the the uh, the pressures, the difficulties for uh, working class communities in those circumstances to um, establish the cooperative movement back then were greater than what the people are facing today. So if it was possible to do it then, uh, you know, with with um, working no, class I, people. I, 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 Chris and I, I admire you, but but respectfully, I, I disagree. Okay. Look, the, the the point here is that if you go back and and let's just take this to the financial realm for a second, right? Um, um, there's a terrible. Well, there's a there's a man called Nick Ferrari who was talking this morning or, or yesterday morning on how the city drives. The financial uh, the, the country the financial sector drives the country right yeah. and and you listen to that on, on in, in the car on the way in and you think this guy is clueless because ultimately the city is a cost center for everybody right and nobody has got their head around this not least the cooperative sector right so so the the city of london 
get this in your mind, is a cost center, is a, is, it isn't a value add, it is a value subtract for everybody, right? Ferrari's there saying, oh, get everyone back to work. We, we need to get everyone back. Let's get the city working again. What he's saying is, get all the serfs back into the workplace, get the rentier economy going again, and let's get it all moving. Mm. That to the cooperative movement is a total anathema, right? Because it isn't about getting everything moving again. It's about reconstituting things on lines that are equitable to the stakeholders within those economies. And guess what? When I say that, shareholders absolutely terrified because they're like, well, where's my money? Mm -hmm. I've risked capital. I've, I've risked... I, They've risked nothing. I've risked capital. No, you haven't. You've risked a few quid. Yeah, but but then what? So so we have got a when it, before we even get to the cooperative movement, before we even get to Mondragon, before we even get to, to we have got a massive education job to do on on the difference between money and value, between the difference between currency and wealth. And, 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 you know, the hardest thing on all this, which breaks my, genuinely breaks my heart, is that if you can go to workers and explain that, they'll agree with you. But here's the killer point. They haven't got the time to entertain the thought. Mm. And the beauty about cooperatives is that they give people huge amounts of space and time to be creative. They give people huge amounts of space but space and time to be reflective. They, 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 they give people the opportunity to live, right? Mm. Let's go to Alan Greenspan. The optimum worker condition is to be nervous, neurotic, and insecure. Mm. And David Graeber was absolutely bang on on this. He said, do you know what, Ross? At the first time in his life, Alan Greenspan's been honest. Yeah. So I suppose the question that I put to both of you is, where do we, in the last 15 minutes, where do we go from here then? Uh, do we just abandon any notion that we should support uh, people or encourage people or should we focus on, on education? Um, what, what should be... What should the priority be, would you suggest, then, in terms of, of taking this agenda forward? Perhaps uh, I'll start with you, John, and then uh, you can come, come back while you're thinking on that one, Ross. So I'll go with two, but there's loads of things. I could say I'll say two things. Firstly, the co-op movement by its nature is a pragmatic movement, and so it started by people wanting to solve problems they had, and, and we will continue to work with individuals and small groups who have individual problems at a grassroots level, that a co-op solution will help. And we'll just chip away at that. We'll continue to do it. We've done it for years. We'll continue. It would be fantastic if big thinkers and uh, systematic changes can take place. But I am not hopeful for that. And I will continue to work with small groups, small communities to help them where we can. And hopefully, if we chip away at that, that's one part of the solution. Um, but yeah, that's not exciting. It's just just boring practical work of helping people set co-ops up. The the other thing which I'm mindful of is a lot of, I, I feel when I look back to the labor movement and what was successful is it was a very holistic approach to the person. So, you know, yes, there was the unions. Yes, there was the co-op movement, but as well as all those things, they set social clubs up, they set up cycling clubs, they helped yeah. people with their education and their, and fun. Let's not, you know, the working men's clubs back in the day were about fun and about entertainment. And I think one of the things a lot of social movements nowadays have missed is they're, they're too polarised, they're too separate, they're, they support specific things. And I, and I think the big, the big thing for me that I think would change what we do is, is having a much more holistic approach to the person. You know, their education, their job, their the fun they do in the evening and bringing those communities together. Because if there's one thing we really have got a problem with is it's the destruction of communities 
whether they're local communities or just communities of people. And I think you're not going to solve this problem if you don't think about people holistically and all the, all the issues they face. So co-ops, we will focus on the bit is, is about them helping themselves, businesses. And we really hope the other parts of and other social movements help individuals with those other parts of their lives to grow. And where do the trade unions fit in on this, John? Uh, or don't they? So for me, trade unions in, in workplaces which can't be co-ops for whatever reason, and, you know, trade unions definitely play their, their role. In workplaces where the trade union thinks they can mobilise the workforce to convert it into a co-op, we're all for that and we'll work with those unions on that. And actually within worker co-ops, you know, some, some of the worker co-ops, particularly the larger worker co-ops, are unionised because unions play a role in any business. And so unions and co-ops can work with each other. There's no reason why they, they can't. Um, it's just, should a trade union run a business? No, it shouldn't. It, it's there for the workers. But a co-op's there for the workers as well, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the co-op is there to run a business. The co-op is not, you know, is not always there for the individual. And right. sometimes individual will fall out with their business. And that's where a trade union plays a role in a worker co-op. Inevitably, you know, people fall out. And so there is a role for trade unions in worker co-ops. Sure. Yeah. Ross, where, where do we go from here then? What's your what's your prescription? We, we embrace both. Look, um, the Germans have got it sort of right. You know, the, the oligarchs, the 1%, however you want to define it in the West, have, have always talked about the fact that, you know, uh, trickle-down economics works. Well, turns out it's a total disaster. There's no academic research for it. It's 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 a, a bunch of propaganda that tr trickle-down is, is the way forward. If you look at Germany now, there's something really interesting happening and has been really for the last 20 years. They've always maintained their unions in Germany. And, that, and, and that's unique, right? Because the Germans have understood that since the Second World War, unless you have uh, the um, working class, the, the unions, the workers, uh, able to enter into the norms of the economy, right? Then you're not gonna have an economy because ultimately the bottom end of the economy dies and, and then everything else collapses. And in the UK, we've got the uh, diametrically opposed situation. You've got uh, the Duke of Westminster uh, of late dying, um, and his son taking over, who's now a billionaire, uh, and, and then the whole of the top of the um, uh, social strata, if you like, thriving whilst everything else wilts on, withers on the vine. Right. So in stats terms, if you want stats, you've got the top uh, three, four percent of the economy thriving beyond belief. The bottom 25 to 30 percent of the economy not even able to enter into the norms of economic ac activity. Yeah. Aggressive. Is that is that is that how we're going to roll? Mm. So so. So the Germans or, or whoever have realized that you, you make sure that those unions are healthy. Mm. Yeah. And this is an anathema. To, I mean, imagine saying that to Thatcher. Yes. What? What? Unions are healthy? Imagine saying it to um, that clown that's in, in number 10 at the moment. So what do we do, though? I mean, the point is, Ross, what do we do? I mean, we're in a situation now where we've got, we've got, Tory, we've got Tory government in who are, who are factual. Organised. Look, you've got to really, and, and this might be, this might be, this might be not be right for this programme or so, but here's the thing. You've got to ignore, as um, Jose Maria Afarlabara, who's unpronounceable, but Arizmana, uh, at Mondragon, back in the Basque Country, you've got to ignore the political class. Mm. I, I promise you. You, you you've, got to, you've just got to put one thing in your mind from this conversation, is that every politician in the UK, at the end of the debt cycle, end of capitalism, end days of financialization, every politician is a colossal distraction. Mm. And if you don't think 
that regardless of the political cue, I mean, Keir Starmer is a case in point of someone who could be bought and sold like a piece of meat in a livestock auction, right? If you don't think that these guys aren't doing, are doing your bidding for you, you're, you're nuts. So what you've got to do is ignore the political uh, uh, spectrum, the political class, every, everything about it, and you have to organize and get together and do your own thing. And my view is provided people can park their egos and get over themselves and all that stuff, and uh, if you can put together a worker co-op or you can put together some sort of cooperative movement where you can gel together and something's bigger than yourself, then you're on the, you're on the right road. Because ultimately what we're coming to the end of, and this is my last bit, is we're coming to the, the, the end game of um, financialized capitalism, 100%. Look at what's happening in the money markets. Two, we're coming to the end game definitely of, um, uh, of Westminster. No one listens to them anymore. Like literally no one. Look at the, it's a clown circus. Mm. And then the last point, we're coming to the end of education. So, and, and there's your killer point. So nobody now wants to come out of university with £250,000 worth of debt to go and become a lawyer or whatever. Everyone's now starting to look in different directions. And the, uh, uh, the opportunity and the onus, if, if I can put it that way, is for us as a generation of people, is to say to other people, say, look, there's a different way. There's a different way to go here. Because all that stuff that's happened over the last 40 years since Thatcher was actually built on hot air. And actually now we've got the ability to create real value, real wealth, which isn't just monetized all the time and house prices, wages and all that nonsense. Actually, we've got the ability to recreate an economy where we can create real services, real products, real value and offer it to you. And, and I think that when you start talking in those terms, it gets people really excited. Mm. So my view is, from a German model, yes, of course, you keep the unions going, but let's face it, she did such a good job on it uh, that the, the Iron Lady the unions in this country have finished. We need a new way to go. Co-ops are the way to do it. However, how do you marshal that? How, where's the leadership? Uh, and and how do you how, and how do you create them? It's it's actually a creative job. It's an architecture job. How do you create them in a way that enables them to create as much opportunity for all the people involved? Well, look, we've only got five minutes left, and uh, I'm just going to put one question that's that's coming from from viewers, and we only got time for for one question, but it sort of picks up on what you were just saying there, uh, Ross. And it's this, uh, how can we help as a community organization to educate people then, to kind of inspire people to get through this? I mean, perhaps if you could both give us a couple of minutes on that and then we'll, we'll have to end. Any thoughts on that, John? And then we'll come back to, to Ross to finish off. What can we do? So our big issue is awareness. Not enough people know that cooperatives are a realistic, viable model for for providing decent livelihoods for you. And, and so I would say, go to our website, uk.coop, look at the case studies of the sorts of co-ops we set up, you know, gig economy, freelancers, uh, you know, practical shops, pubs, farms, housing co-ops, you know, credit unions. There's, there's so many good, successful examples of co-ops. The issue is, is most people don't know about it. Yeah. And then the next issue is, it's mobilizing those people to set them up. And that, and, and I think for community organisers and mobilisers who who are good at that, that's the skill the, the current co-op movement lacks. It's the ability to mobilise and organise people. We've got the skills of technically setting up co-ops, but we need the we need the support of people who are really well, good I mean, at mobilising communities. As an organisation, um, I mean, just I'm just thinking about the 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 resistance movement, the festival of resistance that that we're trying to set up. We, we you know we've got thousands of people up and down the country who are keen. Who see that the you know the political class is is broken that kind of our representative democracy isn't working and they're looking for some alternative uh, way forward as it were. 
and uh, maybe some of those in some areas, maybe not every area, but maybe there might be local champions who, who would be willing to try and mobilize and bring people together. I mean, what, what support could you offer support to, to people to do that, to be those kind of evangelicals, if I can put it like that, to, to go in and, uh, and encourage people to look at setting co-ops up? Do you want me to run a webinar boot camp or a physical boot camp where we take people through, you know, an hour, you know, anything from an hour to a full day's kind of boot camp on how to raise awareness of co-ops and how to get people started? We can do that. Um, so so I mean, co -op you're looking at setting up uh, chapters up and down the country and, uh, you know, maybe that's one of the things that we could offer. If you're, you're saying you'd be prepared to do that, then, you know, we may we may pick up a few, you know, a few people, maybe a lot of people who are on the ground, because this can't, I don't think, it can't be done by me, it can't be done from the centre, it needs to be done on the ground, doesn't it? So we exactly, need... Exactly right. So exactly right. Just, just finish us off in the last couple of minutes then, Ross, in, in, in your thoughts then. Exactly right. People have to, look, this isn't, like, co-ops on top down, right? And and, and 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 my frustration with the whole, um, well, with the, with the co-op movement, but also with the political classes, if we give a diktat from here, then eventually people will go and do it. No, absolute nonsense. Mm. Do you know the biggest thing? Do you know the most beautiful and elegant thing about co-ops? They find latent talent in areas that you'd never expect it. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so I can sit in Westminster, Chris, as you were as an MP, and go, oh, we're going to do this in Derby. Oh. Yeah. Scousers like toffee, so we'll we'll make a toffee shop. I mean, nonsense, right? Nonsense. You go out to the area, you go out to those people, and you say, "What what do you need to do it?" And the the absolute beauty of co-ops is it that it brings out of people the innate talent and beauty within them, which allows them to express that to the wider community, which ultimately gives. Everybody, not just the person giving it, meaning and purpose. Mm. So, and, 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 and guess what? I, guess what? I never talked about in all of that. Go on. Money. No. Right. No, interesting. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, 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 and now we talk. And now we talk because it's not about money. It's not about redevelopment. It's not about house prices. It's not about property and democracy and all that. It's about meaning and purpose. So if you really want really wonderful, vibrant, beautiful community where people could, and I'm not being, I'm not being utopian. I've looked into co-ops a lot. I understand that the beauty, that the most, you, that, that in, in capitalist terms, it's called the USP, a unique selling point, right? The unique selling point about bloody uh, co-ops is that it finds latent talent in areas that, and, and by the way, that often the people in those areas didn't even know they had it. And then they gift it forward and this whole thing emerges. Exactly how Mondragon happened. Yeah. So 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 forget this top-down nonsense. Forget all this, oh, we're gonna we're gonna come and help you. Ronald Reagan, the worst nine words in the history of the English, British, whatever language, is you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> You know, they've never ever once helped. There are, the government's a ham fisted disaster, as we all know. The mm. beauty, the beauty. Let's talk about the poetry, the, the harmony of co ops. The beauty is that they find latent talent within that area, bring it out, and it creates more community value. Well, look, that's a great note to, to end on. Thank you very much indeed. We have run out of time. In fact, we've gone slightly over time. Um, I'm grateful to both John and to Ross. Uh, that was a really challenging uh, program. And uh, uh, I don't know about anybody watching, but uh, I was uh, I was kind of knocked down and then you built me back up again. Uh, I was kind of quite depressed and thought that it was just a council of despair, but I thought it was uh, really inspiring what you were both saying at the end there. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we've got some practical outcomes from this uh, uh, discussion this evening. And as we build this movement and as we create local uh, chapters, uh, you know, if we can inspire people, if they feel switched on, that uh, cooperative in, in their local area might be something that will, will work. But it, these solutions need to come from the from the bottom up. And and it's wonderful to know that, that John is offering himself and his organization as, as a resource uh, for that. And uh, 
and hopefully uh, Ross, we can we can get you on the case as well as a kind of a motivational speaker. So thank you both very much indeed for your contributions this evening. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties you experienced, Ross, in, in getting on to the the program at the outset, uh, but it's great to have you, uh, uh, albeit for a uh, truncated period for the program. Thanks everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, don't forget to tune in to Resistance TV at the same time, same place next week. Thank you for watching and good night.